All right, um, I will go ahead and get us started. So welcome everybody to Empowering Change, Bio-Based Materials for Climate and Cultural Shifts. In this session, we'll be exploring the role that bio-based materials will play in meeting climate goals and how we can create a social and cultural shift to embrace low embodied carbon materials. Um, for those of you looking to get continuing education credit, the learning units and objectives are shown here. Uh, we'll be following up after this event with a survey to submit your AIA member number. Um, we will also be hopefully answering all the Q&A during this session, but in the event that we don't get to your questions, we'll ask uh, Pete and Netta to answer those after the session and we'll post that on the Carbon Positive website. And we'll also be posting the recordings of all of these sessions on the Carbon Positive website um, in the same place that you found the, the Zoom link for this session. Um, so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the session, uh, Pete Walker. Uh, Pete is a professor of Innovative Construction Materials at the University of Bath. He is a fellow of the Institution of Structural Engineers and a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers. His current research interests include bio-based construction materials, materials for improved indoor air quality, structural masonry, and innovative timber engineering. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to you, Pete. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, so as you heard, yeah, I'm speaking to you from Bath in the UK. I'm going to give a brief introduction, but before I do that, uh, I'll just introduce the main act of this presentation, which is Etta Madete, who is speaking from Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, Etta is an architectural designer with her company BuildX, and she's also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. And she works a lot with bio-based materials and also using such materials to help empower uh, people, particularly women, to um, work in construction. And so you'll hear much more about uh, her work, but I'll give a quick opening presentation about some of my work on bio-based materials and then um, we'll move from there. And if you have any questions as we go, I guess put them in the chat box and we'll pick them up at the end, hopefully. Uh, right, so if I share my screen. Uh, Hopefully this will work and everyone can see that. Uh, so um, that's just basically who I am and just an overview. So I thought I'd just give a very quick overview about bio-based building materials. Um, this is an area of research that I've been doing at Bath for 20 years or so. And so of course, some of the most well-known construction materials around the world are plant-based building materials, uh, renewable building materials, timber, of course, and wood-based products, most famous of them. But we've seen in recent years, uh, certainly in, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, interest and use of more traditional uh, materials, such as co-products of agricultural production, both food production and non-food production, so straw, associated with wheat and barley and rice uh, or and hemp materials as well and fiber materials from flax, sisal, canaf and hemp. Um, bamboo of course is a, has a long history of use in construction for structural uses and cladding as do reeds along with straw as well uh, for a variety of uses. And I think increasingly also use of agricultural waste materials. And I think in many ways, there's very little waste from agriculture. Farming is very efficient at using its materials, but some materials are burnt uh, and the, the uh, ash from these materials can be pozzolanic and or can be used as a cement replacement material. But as well as bio-based building materials, you should not forget, as well as plants, not forget that there are also building materials we take from animals as well. So whether this is sheep's wool used as insulation or fibers from horse hair, um, for example, which is used in plasters traditionally, or indeed materials like blood and um, enzymes, casein, urine, and excrement from our animals have traditionally been used, for example, in as stabilizers in earthen construction. So applications, uh, we use bio-based materials as aggregates. This is a kind of A to Z list. Uh, you know, we use it to make boards and panel type products uh, for cladding and roofing materials, for flooring materials. So there's a variety of external and internal uses, structural uses, non-structural uses. 
Uh, in the Europe, I would say in particular, then other than timber, um, bio-based materials have been used a lot in fiber form, in particular for insulation purposes. Uh, but as I said, we use the ashes of uh, burning plant material, potentially if it's used as biomass to generate electricity or heat, can be used as uh, additive in cement and concrete materials. Of course, a variety of bio-based materials are used as effective structural elements, and we also use it as substrates. Um, so for example, uh, reed board can be used as a substrate for plastering. So some of the projects that I've been involved in whilst I've been at Bath. So this is a, a brewery in, and most of these projects are in, uh, in the UK, in England. Uh, and this is Adnams Brewery, which is in the east of uh, the country. And this big building um, is comprised of hemp lime blocks. So hemp and lime is a mixture of the, the woody chip from the hemp production and lime as a traditional building material. It's been used to make about 90,000 blocks which form these walls together with this large glue lamb structure. And one of the benefits of this is it's helped to regulate the space, the environment inside this building, which has been ideal for storing beer, which is the purpose of a brewery. This is a project in the north of England, in York, uh, where this office building procured by the local government is clad in uh, straw bales. These panels here you can see are prefabricated straw bales which are finished with lime and uh, as well as being used uh, built off site as a sort of um, uh, prefabricated form of construction. Uh, it also offers opportunities for different stakeholders to get involved in the construction and um, it also provides very effective um, insulation material. This is a project I wasn't immediately involved in. It's, it's at the University of East Anglia in Norwich in, East Ang in Eastern England. And these, the cladding in particular in this building, there are many other features, but the cladding in this building is prefabricated thatch in a vertical sense using uh, wheat straw thatch and provides a very attractive uh, finish to a very sort of modernist looking building. Um, in the last 20 years or so, there's been lots of work on, or some work in straw bale construction. And this is prefabricated straw bale construction, um, not prefabricated, sorry, load bearing straw bale construction building. In some ways, a very traditional looking house with a pitched roof and usually finished with a lime plaster. But some of the innovation that we have been involved in is doing prefabricated straw bale buildings. So these building panels here are used to make a load bearing house. And this is the sort of first prototype house known as the bale house. So these panels here are made insulated with straw and then finished with lime plaster and then also additionally clad with timber. And then from the prototype, there was this housing scheme here built in Leeds uh, in the north in Yorkshire in the north of England. Uh, again, these panels are stacked as load bearing panels. And then just to show you can also do straw bale building and then it, the, in this case the planners required the house to be built to be clad in traditional red fired clay bricks so behind these walls are straw bale walls which provide the insulation and the finish there is in brickwork some of the other work i mentioned briefly is in hemp construction and this is uh, just a for showing the form here in a traditional sense of casting it around a timber structure here so you have these timber studs and these, the solid walls are made from a mixture of the hemp, which is like wood chip uh, size particles. You can see they're bound in a, a lime binder, which is cast and allowed to dry to form a solid wall in a very simple form of construction because there's no cavities in the wall and usually finished with a lime plaster. As you can imagine, the labor around this can be quite slow. So uh, alternative people have looked at spraying it instead. And this is a sort of wall finished in an external lime plaster. And then moving on from that as well as prefabricated technologies, building panels indoors uh, and then placing them on site has become increasingly common with bio-based materials, partly to address concerns about the climate and, and using um, these materials that some are susceptible to damage in wet weather that if you can make the product indoors and then you take it to the site and also other benefits of prefabrication in terms of speed of construction, for example. So here's a hemp line panel. It's been cast horizontally and this is the hemp there. And then these are the panels being installed together with the steel frame building. And this is part of a large 
supermarket. Uh, for those of you familiar with the UK, then you'll be familiar with Marks and Spencers as a large su supermarket chain, and, and these are clad in hemp line panels. And one of the benefits of using bio-based building materials is through the process of photosynthesis, the, its ability to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it within the plant-based material. So you have a lower embodied carbon or lower carbon emissions through this form of construction. One other project briefly, uh, this is a cork building and the aspiration of the um, architect was to build a complete envelope of this building using cork. Now cork is the bark of the cork oak tree, usually found in Europe in the Mediterranean. I mean, uh, some of you are familiar with it as stoppers in bottles. And here the roof and the walls are entirely made from cork and it's a very fine, low, um, energy efficient building. Uh, I think this is the, the final slide. So moving forward, the opportunities, because in many cases, apart from timber, then many of these materials still remain relatively niche in their use in, in, in certainly in Europe. Uh, but there are, the opportunities are, and um, reasons why people are showing interest is the re potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which is what this is, in terms of lower embodied calm, as I mentioned about photosynthesis, and also environmental performance of the building through improved um, insulation, faster construction, healthier buildings uh, through hydrothermal performance. Uh, and which, without going into too much distraction about what hydrothermal performance is, then in terms of its regulation of humidity inside a building uh, helps potential greater resilience to future changes in our climate making good use of renewable plant materials. So there's a reduced waste and we're using renewable sources rather than non-renewable resources. And it's also provided new climate, you know, new markets to agriculture and farmers. So that's me done, sorry for a little over, but uh, if you need to get in touch with me, then p.walker at Bath, as you can see there. So thank you, I'll um, now stop sharing my screen and however, hand over to Etta for her presentation. Yes, um, so thank you Pete as I tried to transition to sharing my screen. As I was saying my name is Etta Madete, I'm from Nairobi, Kenya and for me we're shifting the conversation a little bit to start talking about how we can empower change and I left architecture school right when the built environment was colliding with the climate action movement and for us we we, we were excited because I studied sustainable architecture and um, I was really excited to see how we could contribute. But when I entered the industry, what I found is that the reality is not the same, especially in the Nairobi context. The materials available for use are stone, concrete, steel, and those are the most accessible, affordable materials. Um, and so for me, it was very disappointing, but the reality is that this is what we have to work with. Um, Africa is urbanizing at such a fast rate and the urgency to build is being fulfilled at a really fast rate. Um, just to give you a bit of context, 60 years ago, there was only 1 million residents um, in, in, the, in the largest city in Africa, but now there are over 40 cities and we expect to have 2.5 billion people by 2050. Basically, we'll have about 60%, um, we'll be 60% urbanized by 2050 and expect that 950 to 1 billion people will be living in these urban centers. So there's an urgency to build. And I felt that the architecture, the industry was not actually trying to, to make this happen. Um, and it's not just Africa, it's globally. There's all these evidence of unequal scenes where the architectural community is working for the 1%. You can see up here in these unequal scenes at the top there, you have manicured gardens, natural ventilation, um, nice designs, but at the bottom there where the majority of the population are, there's lack of housing. In Kenya, there's a 2 million housing deficit. Um, and it's not, as I said, it's not just in Africa. The UN predicts that there's going to be 230 billion square meters of construction in the next 40 years. To give you some perspective, that's basically like building a city of Paris every single week. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to actually embrace that growth. Um, in the building and construction industry, 
we all know that the, the materials we have to work with are just not great. And that's what this conference is about. How can we shift the way that we build? Because 40% of carbon comes from the built environment and 5% of the greenhouse gases are actually contributed from cement, steel and concrete each. But we all know that that's what this conference is about. And in fact, globally, the world is shifting to bio-based materials. As Pete shared, the future is bio-based and there's all these alternatives available. That's timber, that's bamboo, that is microtile, mushroom, for example, our colleague um, founded a company called Mycotile, um, looking at mushrooms to be used for, for paneling and sealing systems and they're in prototype right now. Um, and we're really excited about this and we believe um, that this can, can actually create a great shift. This is our Nakuru children's home and that we built a couple of years ago, built in timber and earth bag. So bio-based materials are making a comeback globally as well as in the region. Um, and the beauty about this is that we're really excited. Uh, I'm excited. And I think the reason it's so exciting is because Africa is primed for this. Um, basically, be basically because we are actually an agricultural economy. 60% of sub-Saharan Africans are actually smallholder farmers. So we are a, a growing, growing economy. Um, and 40% of our GDP comes from agriculture. So we are ready to embrace this revolution of bio-based materials, growing of trees, growing high economic value in the long run and try to garner all the, all the income that comes from the construction industry. Um, but at BuildX, we've actually realized that having a sustainable solution is not enough. In the past 10 years where we've been working in, um, in, in, in across Africa in projects, um, in education projects, in housing projects, in healthcare projects, we've been, we've been tackling this idea of alternative building materials. Um, so even before thinking about bio-based materials, we're looking at how can we change the way that we use, see the materials that are available. So using earth, for example, in the Sachibondo hospital, you can see here in Zambia, um, it looks like it was a finished product, but the journey to it was, was much harder. And it wasn't hard because the, the, the material wasn't, wasn't available. It was hard because 80% of the effort into, into getting this um, hospital up and running was convincing the community that this material is accessible, it is available, and it is strong. Um, in fact, even the arch that you can see on the left there, the brick vaults, uh, were, were not an accepted form of roofing. In fact, we had to have several experiments, just creating the arch and putting several weights on top to get the community to accept that this that brick or this earth below my feet can actually hold up, um, can hold up an entire roof. Furthermore, we, 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 would, we wanted to sh have a cultural shift in the way that people perceived a material that they are, they are aware of. So it's either timber or brick and being able to use the local materials. But even then, we, requ we were required to almost plaster the walls just to plaster some of the walls, just to give it a semblance of normalcy. Uh, because the perception is that stone and concrete are what can stand and what, are, what is strong. Also in um, an earth bag residence we designed in Nyeri here, um, we had fantastic clients who were looking for alternative building materials, but um, even then during the construction process, trying to convince the contractors in the area, trying to convince um, the, the labor force that this is, this is actually a viable building material is an uphill task. So building in sustainable materials and bio-based materials is actually, it's, it's not the problem, it's not the barrier. Um, and in our experience, we find that trying to sort of alternate between um, bio-based and what is available, like in Shiala Primary School, trying to show the effects of earth, um, as well as um, having these recycled oil drums that are filled in. So the projects we've been working on, we've been seeing that it's, it's important, first of all, to have the technical solution and to have that advocacy. But the most important thing is to convince the community that, it, that these materials are actually feasible to use. Nakuru Children's Home as well, as, as described earlier, the, the use of bamboo, the use of timber in alternative different ways, but convincing, convincing 
others that a school or a children's home does not need to be built in stone or timber. And just trying to, trying to empower the right category of people to embrace these materials for wide, wide scale change. Um, and through all that experience, we've had three main, three main pushbacks. The first is that in reality, in the Nairobi context or Kenya and, and the African context, cement, steel, and concrete are the most available and accessible materials. They're the cheaper materials. They're politically influenced materials. So the wider population um, have accepted this as the way to build. Um, furthermore, the second pushback is the fact that um, this is the, the, the deforestation, de deforestation in Kenya is happening at an unprecedented rate. In Africa, um, especially, we're seeing almost, we, we had 30% of Africa's forests, but now we have about 17% of them. So we're losing our forest cover. And so right now we have logging bans that are preventing people from cutting trees. So it's difficult to convince um, policymakers and the government and the community that we need to plant trees and cut them down to build um, out of timber or to build out of bamboo or bio-based materials. So the cultural shift is, um, is, 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 that's another pushback in that cultural shift. Um, but the potential is there because as I said, Africa is an agricultural economy. It's an, it has huge agricultural potential. But then again, for example, the palm oil industry in Southeast Asia, it, they're, they're trying to sell palm oil, which is a great sustainable alternative to crude oil, but it has caused about 50% of deforestation in the area. So again, a sustainable solution is just not enough. We need to go a little bit further. We need to go to the next step. Um, but the next step is not too far away because as you can see in Sweden, in, the la in less than 100 years, they managed to gain back 70% of their forest cover through a commercial forestry industry bolstered by, uh, by, by construction used for, uh, timber used for construction. So the potential is there, but the approach needs to be carefully uh, um, cultivated. Um, so as I said, Af uh, Africa is urbanizing. There's an urgency to build. We are primed to build in bio-based materials, but we have three pushbacks. The first is that the cheaper, higher carbon materials. The second is this sustainable supply that we need to culture and to cultivate the right kind of um, discussion amongst. But actually, these are all pushbacks. But the one barrier, the one barrier that can actually prevent us from achieving any of these mission visions, 2030s, um, that we're all here to try to discuss is social cultural acceptance. Um, and it sort of makes you fall into this, what I call the SDG trap, where you come up with band-aid solutions that don't have long lasting change, where we are focusing, for example, um, on gender inequality in our build her program or sustainable cities and communities, but not thinking about the entire value chain. So for us, we're thinking that we, we, we know that we need to have a complete shift and move to SDG 12, for example, and look at where are some of our materials coming from, who's growing them, and how can we influence that to change the way we see bio-based materials, as well as en enable us to look for partners who can enable these goals. As I said, we are still architects, we're designers, we're a design build company, but we need to be able to re be responsible for the entire value chain. And so um, we founded, a, um, our sister company, Build Her, was founded in 2008. Um, and this company came from the Nakuru project um, where we were, we were building a house, um, we were building the children's home and, uh, and um, the owner's house and we realized, wait a minute, there's only three women on the actual site. And the, 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 the problem wasn't that women should be on the site, but a re an equitable gender representation creates an equitable environment. And so um, from that we, formed, we founded Build Her where we train women in construction. Um, and this has seen great advancement. And it's not, and the lessons we've learned from that is that in reality, the construction industry in our context and the global context has only ever had one voice. And this is the construction industry all the way from the value chain, who's producing the materials, all the way to the very end, who's using the spaces. Um, to give you some context in Kenya, there are only 11% of the registered architects in Kenya are women. And um, I think that, uh, there's about 7% of, engin of the engineers in Kenya are women. Um, so there's only, only ever been one voice. Um, and that voice is what has, needs to change 
to create this social cultural perception, sh perception shift um, and to leverage social capital so that um, to, level, to leverage a social capital, we need to involve all voices at the table at community level. And especially when we're dealing with bio-based materials, because at community level, these are the people who are growing the materials. These are the people who are working with the materials. These are the people who are influence other, people's to use, other people to use these materials as well. Um, so the Build Her program currently has trained 170 women. It started in 2018. And we hope to train about 5,400 in the next five years. But I don't even think it's, it's just sort of trying to um, create leverage and equity in the community. Um, when it comes to bio-based material, women are actually the, uh, the ones who produce most of our food. So 64% of women working in the agricultural sector in Africa and contribute 80% of the world's food production. Yet in reality, they only own 1% of the land. So having the, the sort of leverage to, to, to create not only empowerment for them to grow the cities of the future, but also to, to enable them to, to have ownership of this, of this change and to design and build the, the sustainable cities of our future. Working hand in hand in the community, working hand in hand with men is the only way to actually have long-term change. And we don't have to go too far. In Kenya, our, our very own Nobel laureate um, started the Green Belt Movement in 97, 1977 and has planted over 51 million trees. It's just one shift in the way that we see the, 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 the forestry sector created a, a huge shift in perception. Um, and so, as I said, this is not a feminist manifesto. Um, this is actually a call to reset our approach. Um, the technical solutions are there. The technical information on how to build in bio-based materials, it's there. But how do we begin actually inspiring the community to use these materials and not be afraid of them? Um, how do we inspire the community not to perceive these materials as a poor man's materials, but as the future of our cities? How do we inspire them to build or to, to grow the trees to build the future? Um, going forward at BuildX, we, we, we're sort of changing our approach. As I said, we're looking at SDG 12. Um, so we're looking at the entire value chain. In our upcoming affordable housing projects, for example, Zima Homes um, and the prefabricated housing project that we're collaborating with, um, uh, we're collaborating with, we are creating, we're looking at the forestry sector. We're looking at how do we empower women to grow the trees that will create the, the buildings of the future or grow the, the mushrooms that will create the the panels and the ceiling panels for the future. Um, and so we're looking at the entire value chain. We're working with, um, with, uh, with projects all the way from the source. Um, in our anti-slavery, um, with the anti-slavery knowledge network, we've worked with um, AKN to ensure that as we're looking at healing spaces for people recovering from, um, from human trafficking, that they have access to the right information, the right spaces um, and empowering them through information-based design. Through Build Her as well, we are enabling, we're enabling community shift in the entire construction sector, creating a more equitable space, creating more accessible information and, and, and community-wide community -wide understanding that the construction sector is for everyone and designed by everyone. Um, as well as looking at our supply chain, um, gender representation in our construction projects as, and ensuring that there's a gender lens approach even to design. Uh, how many eyes are having, how many eyes are there on the street? How many eyes are there uh, in technology transfer? Um, and so for, for, in this conference, you've had uh, technical solutions for timber building, for bam bamboo building, for bio-based materials. But I, I'm urging you all to go beyond the technical, to, to, to go beyond the, 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 the specifications and the, the detailing, which are all really important, um, but instead to leverage social capital so that the change and the shift actually happens. If we do wanna meet our goals in 2030, we need to work through other partners, whether it's understanding more in the forestry sector, working with women in construction, working with women in growing these materials. Um, and as I said, this is the Kenyan context. Think about the, the policy shift that needs to happen in your context to make these materials acceptable and perceived in a different way. 
Um, thinking about policy shift in how you perceive bio-based material. Is it an agricultural product or is it an economic product that can be used for commercial entities? Um, and lastly, and, and last but not least, is inclusivity and equity. Bringing everyone, everyone's voices to the table so that we have a shift, not just at the at the 1%, the 5%, or the one or two buildings as, as, um, that we're doing, but instead have open source access so that everyone can be able to build in these bio-based materials. Um, so that the 230 billion square meters that is gonna get built um, can actually get built in, in, in great materials. Otherwise, we would end up resetting all the efforts that we've, we've put into um, in the climate change movement. Um, that's all from me. Uh, I think I'll, I'll have any questions that anyone needs to ask, um, and yes. Thank you, Etta. Um, so this is Pete again. Um, let me turn my video on so you can see me. So we do have some questions and some comments as well. So I'll just say, um, comment in the chat box from Lee uh, is beautiful, inspiring and thoughtful presentation. So thank you for your time and energy in this. Um, so we have um, some questions as well. Um, from, uh, let's restart. So from Lee again, how have developing building codes supported bio-based materials uh, and what are the challenges in this, re in this realm? Um, do you have any, any comments about building codes? I mean, how important are building codes to your work um, in Kenya as an architect? It's very important, um, but however, we sort of, it's sort of like a chicken and an egg. We sort of need the buildings to be built to prove that they can be built so that the building code can shift to accept alternative building materials. Um, and so the government has a bit of room for you to sort of enable you to sort of test materials as long as you're able to reference global standards, like if British standards have already specified that mass timber buildings can be built or um, brick buildings can be built. So you can reference and build and that can influence precedent for change, change in building code. But in reality right now, alternative building materials have not yet been accepted at policy level, even at community level. So that's why it's important to sort of build the first prototypes, but build them almost as precedents to inspire change. And the beauty about the, the, the context here especially is that people build anyway. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we're influencing the people who are building anyway, um, especially those who are building outside the code to use the right materials. Um, and so, as I said, it's chicken and egg, and we're hoping that if we're to do our, achieve our goals in the next 10 years, is to sort of work at both levels. So policy level, as well as community level. Okay, great, thank you. I'll just add my sort of experience context in that, in terms of building standards and codes for some of the materials I talked about, none exist in the UK. We, buildings have to be built to comply with the building regulations, um, but we, we, and we still manage engineers and architects still manage to do it uh, as long as you demonstrate compliance. One of the limitations of not having codes and standards is potentially the lack of warranty. So it can be difficult for people to borrow money for the bank to build say a straw bale building because the bank is nervous about lending the money against such a building without the codes and standards. But in, the, in per se, it doesn't prevent people from, from building these type of structures. Yeah. Um, okay, I move on to another question from J.A. Ginsburg. Uh, what have you learned about long-term durability and maintenance of these uh, materials? Are there any issues about building with bio-based building materials in a, in a tropical climate, perhaps, or in a, in a country where you, you have... Uh, termites, for example, who like to munch on cellulose. So yeah, what's your experience about durability? Um, for all these, I think I'll answer it in, in two ways. The first way is that um, I think the treatment of bio-based materials also needs to be circular because it almost negates the purpose if you're almost using uh, chemicals and um, unrenewable and unsustainable products to treat bio-based materials. So we're trying to move towards more bio-based 
treatment of bio-based materials. Um, but beyond that, um, in our context especially, there's a long history be before what architecture became formal architecture, basically um, architecture before architects, of using bio-based materials to, being, to build long-standing structures, whether it's in earth or timber and all the different regions. And you know, Kenya has very many different climates. You have to be able to understand how were the, how were the bio-based materials in the traditional architecture built and maintained? And you'll learn a lot of lessons from how you sort of, um, as, as Pete mentioned earlier, this um, blood, kaiosine, like it's, it's, it's not, a, a, as I said, a very chemical solution, but looking into the traditional ways of maintaining buildings, or for example, if there's an area for termites, there's ways of dealing with termites, but there's also way, there's a way that you then don't build in timber, but maybe you use bamboo or you use an alternative building material that is also bio-based in that region. So in one way, um, we, we, we try to make sure that that is circular. So finding the actual, the best way to treat in a, bio, in a, in a sustainable way, but also making sure that you're being very region specific um, as well. Okay, thanks Etta. Uh, another question, for a region, if passive vernacular techniques suggest earthen construction, where do you proc procure raw material in, in large cities? So you might have widespread availability to say earthen materials in, in the uh, less urbanized areas. And what about cost? Does, do these buildings cost more or less or yeah? Um. This is the super fascinating thing that happens, especially in Nairobi, and I think I even saw it a couple of hours ago, is that when people, when, when in urban areas, when they're excavating for buildings, there's this huge row of trucks selling sand. Um, so basically they sell sand or they dump sand. So there's, there's, contractors have a problem with sand. They don't know what to do with it. Um, and so we found in one of our, our consultancies that there's a, there's a huge market for actually people buying sands from other construction projects who, who don't need the sand that they're excavating for like five or six basements. Um, so you can actually find sand that you can use in the same, uh, with a, within a very close proximity. Um, but in another area, for example, you'll find something like timber. So like timber, you need to source it from quite far away, especially for commercial forestry. There are not as many um, certified commercial sustainable uh, forests in the area. Um, and so for that, it's, it's, it's about ensuring that the, the cost benefits, because as you said, in urban areas, the, the sourcing stones, cement and concrete also has a transport cost anyway, because the mills and the and the quarries are not in the Nairobi area. So it's about that cost benefit um, compared to the material that you're using. And of course, the sort of dual advantage of bio-based material is that it, it, it sequesters carbon. So it's not just the embodied energy from uh, building it, it's actually the embodied energy it is absorbing. Um, so you, all, you can also do that calculation um, of how much carbon are you storing in your material compared to uh, a, quarry, a quarry that's a little bit closer. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, which I might... Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think we might have to jump to our next session. Um, right, but... okay, that's no yep. problem. I'll, I'll answer any remaining questions in writing. So. Wonderful. And thank you, Etta. Thank you, Pete. That was, in, that was an incredible presentation and really great insight. Um, so to the attendees still on the line, we'll answer your remaining questions and post that on the Carbon Positive website. Um, and we have one final session, uh, well, three final sessions coming up. Um, so we hope to see you on those and you can find the links again on the Carbon Positive website. Um, and with that, thank you both. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Etta. Bye. Thanks, Pete. Bye-bye.